just a quick introduction. My name is Jared Morgan. I'm a cloud architect. A whole organization is going to cloud security. And I, in my spare time, I do security research, mainly focused on cybersecurity topics that uh, intersect with national security and foreign policy uh, issues, things like encryption, surveillance, privacy, disinformation, and nation state activity. I'm also involved in some uh, policy advocacy work. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Jared Rogier and my blog is at criticalvoid.com. So in this talk, we're really going to kind of do a bit of retrospective of the war in Ukraine. We'll talk about Russia's bad OPSEC, uh, the use of drones and radio inter intercepts, um, the kind of cyber war that went on, uh, disinformation and counter disinformation, and then we, where did we go from here. So just a content warning, um, there is some images and videos from the battlefield. It's not super graphic, but I have been asked to include that. Um, so the Russia-Ukraine history really goes all the way back uh, to the dissolvement of the Soviet Union. And the tensions really started to flare with the annexation of Crimea in 2014. And last year, we started to see a buildup of Russian troops at the border, which Russia claimed was a training exercises. However, the satellite photos started to show that over 100,000 troops started to uh, a mass at the border, and uh, Russia kept claiming that this, these were training exercises, um, but this was quickly disproven because they were putting up hospital tents, which they typically don't do uh, during training exercises. And as uh, tension started to increase, you know, the build up just continued. And during this process, NATO uh, member countries started moving uh, vehicles and other military hardware into uh, Ukraine. Um, including ammunition, uh, ammunition, especially the uh, Javelin anti-tank uh, missiles that are very effective against Russian armor, and as well as other supplies that would be needed, for example, like uh, medical supplies. Uh, Taiwan, for example, sent uh, 27 tons of supplies uh, as well. In the process, NATO also started picking up surveillance activities in uh, around Poland to look at what was going on in Belarus, as well as in Ukraine. Um, and NATO countries started training the uh, Ukrainian military on how to use these weapons. Uh, there was advanced training that was done in the UK. And on the 24th of February, which was a Thursday, uh, the invasion started. I remember very distinctly being woken up early in the morning um, with my phone vibrating with all of the news alerts that were going off. And the, when I logged onto Twitter, the very first video that I saw was on the left. Uh, with this uh, missile going into um, an airport in eastern Ukraine. And throughout the day, we started to see, uh, you know, the first casualties of what was going on. Um, as a defender, I was very concerned that we were going to see cyber activity, um, given that in the build-up to the war, there were uh, a considerable number of DDoS attacks that, against the uh, Ukrainian and uh, government, as well as the banking systems. And what Russia tried to do was they tried to instill fear that uh, they wouldn't be able to access their currencies. And then obviously the invasion started, uh, there was wiper malware that was deployed, we'll talk about that in a moment, but I was really concerned that we were going to see a not petia style attack. And given that not petia uh, you know, was very um, impactful in 2007, both in Ukraine and globally, um, thankfully nothing like that happened. Um, NATO had actually prepared for such an event, so they ran these annual uh, simulations uh, called Operation Rock Shield, uh, where they go through these simulations and um, you know kind of develop responses for some of these uh, activities that could happen. Thankfully, nothing magic did happen, um, and I don't know why you know this was the case. You know, is it possible that Russia didn't have the cyber capability that a lot of us fear that they do have, or maybe they didn't want to risk escalation with the West? What did happen though was uh, Russia took out the Viasat KSAT satellite network. Um, this was done by Russian actors, and they managed to do this through a misconfigured legacy VPN at a provider network. Uh, Wiper malware was um, de uh, deployed, which destroyed the configuration files uh, that these terminals used in order to get it back to the network. And at the same time, a large DDoS attack took place to kind of distract the security team of what was going on. And the impact of this was fairly significant. So 30,000 uh, SATCOM terminals went down, um, which affected 5,800 wind turbines in Germany and the communication systems in, uh, of emergency services in France were also affected by this. It wasn't initially clear um, 
why, you know, and why Sadnipur was targeted, but it soon became clear that the real target was the Turkish made uh, TP2 drone, which is used by the Ukrainian military. And uh, typically, these drones operate on line of sight. So um, the active area is fairly small, but you can get a module that you can plug in that connects to the Viasat network, which allows these drones to be uh, controlled remotely. And especially in the beginning of the war, these drones were very effective. Um, the military actually made a music video praising the TB2 drone as well. So uh, with regards to the weapon now, we um, Wapa malware was actually targeted at the beginning of the invasion on uh, to target government systems, banks, ATMs, communication systems, uh, media, including TV and radio, as well as uh, the border systems where it was most impactful. So Ukraine has an identification system called the Doria system, um, and this went down as a result of the um, this Wapa malware. Um, Caesar did put out an alert uh, regarding this, and uh, due to that system being offline, as people were fly, uh, fleeing from the invasion, um, they weren't able to cross the border uh, between Romania and uh, Ukraine. Um, eventually, given the humanitarian crisis that was developing at the border, uh, both Moldova and Romania started allowing people to cross um, the border, uh, even with that system being down. And uh, further on, uh, Microsoft CEO actually stated that he considers this attack the first contravention of the Geneva Convention using digital means. Now, there are some people that disagree with that, but that's just what uh, you know he said. And what we need to really ask ourselves is, is the activity that we've seen really a cyber war? So the media and um, you know certain companies have been you know throwing the term around very loosely. Um, there are a lot of government-sponsored groups on both sides that are attacking one another. Um, in, on the Ukraine side, there's an activist group called the Ukraine IT Army, um, which... Uh, were they started organizing their events um, uh, on Telegram. And in my opinion, this is textbook activism, right? This isn't like cyber warfare. And in my opinion, I think we need to be very careful when we use the term cyber warfare. And yes, it is a bit of an academic discussion, but when something isn't a war, we shouldn't be calling it a war. So if we go around and say everything is fascism, when real fascism actually happens, uh, it actually loses its impact. So, um, what we have seen is electricity and power uh, generation uh, facilities going down, not because of cyber attacks, but because of uh, uh, kinetic activities involving conventional weapons. So, uh, kind of talking about the Ukraine IT army, so they attacked the Moscow uh, Stock Exchange, the largest bank in Russia, uh, Russian CRM systems, a mercenary group uh, that Russia is using, as well as several government institutions were compromised, including police stations, uh, border control customs, and train stations. And the leaked data from these institutions could publish onto DDoS secrets where you can actually go uh, download them. Um, in September, a traffic jam was caused uh, by a collective effort to order a whole bunch of taxis on Yandex's taxi service uh, to the middle of Moscow. And you can see that on the right, it caused quite a bit of the, the traffic jam in Moscow. And again, the question comes up, you know, is this cyber warfare no activism? In 2015, uh, Russia did attack the Ukrainian power grid uh, using the Black Energy 2 malware that abused automation uh, systems uh, that were connected to SCADA and RCS systems. Um, and as a result of this, um, the recovery took about four hours um, for most areas. However, they actually had to send people on trucks to certain substations uh, in order to turn the substations back on. And what we saw in April um, was Russia attacked again a uh, Ukrainian power uh, plant um, with the uh, in destroyer and in controller uh, malware, which used a lot of the same tricks that the previous um, RCS uh, malware has used. Um, due to the previous attack, Russia was actually able to, um, oh, sorry, Ukraine was actually able to uh, kind of, you know, yes, it took down power shortly, but they were able to recover uh, very quickly. And in this case, this is cyber warfare, right? So you have a country attacking another uh, country with kinetic uh, with kinetic conventional weapons, and then they are also using cyber capabilities to actually attack them, and therefore uh, that is like proper cyber warfare. 
Um, just something that I would like to point out. So on the photo on the left of the screen, this is a photo that was shared widely on social media uh, during the um, not better, um, you know, outbreak back in 2017. And on the right, uh, you can see a photo five years later where the same store was actually hit by artillery. And I think it's the first time that this kind of thing has ever happened. Um, I had to, to Mecca for pointing that out. Um, and then moving on to kind of Russia's bad OPSEC and the use of insecure communication. So Russia has been found to be using Chinese-made um, radios that operate on the UHF and F VHF frequencies, and these are not encrypted. So anybody with the signal information can listen into what's going on. Um, and there were several groups in Ukraine that were actually doing this. So they were listening to what was going on, gathering that intelligence, and then passing that on to the Ukrainian military. And as a result, uh, the Ukrainian military was able to get the upper hand on the battlefield, as well as make important strategic and tactical decisions um, on, uh, you know, on the battlefield. What we saw with the radio intercepts is that the Russian military is really disorganized, there's very poor leadership. Um, and what activist groups also started doing is they started trolling uh, the Russian soldiers. So um, in, in this case, somebody asks for a retreat route, and then the jammer replies, uh, you know, go home, it's better to be a deserter than fertilizer. The same activist groups also started jamming Russian radios. So they started uh, putting high pitch noises on the uh, radios that created troll faces, big faces, and among us characters when you put them through a spectrograph. And you can imagine if you're in a tank with these high pitch noises in the tank uh, on, the, on the radio, it could be very, very annoying. And this was very interesting to many intelligence analysts because um, Russia does actually have secure capability. They have the ASOF frequency hopping radios. Um, however, significant corruption took place uh, during the procurement of these uh, radios um, and the manufacturing of these radios was uh, given to the lowest bidder. So a lot of them have faulty parts, but the real reason why we haven't seen a lot of these radios in use is because in the beginning of the war, it was a training exercise, right? So um, not enough key material was actually pulled down to order to support these radios in the battlefield. What did happen at the beginning of the war, a specialist group of Russian soldiers were actually captured um, with both uh, maps and other equipment, um, including uh, weapons. As, and in this example, you can actually see the assault frequency uh, those radios there. Um, and yes, they have been found on the battlefield, but definitely not in, in widespread use. Russia uses a, diff, a whole bunch of different radio systems. Um, the older systems are not interoperable with one another. Um, however, the newer ones are, um, and they form part of a larger system, so they've got vehicles that can do um, rebroadcasting as well as a relay of uh, these signals. And they also have vehicles that can do digital trunk lines uh, for, uh, sorry, can do trunk lines for digital traffic. One of the interesting findings is in the radios that have been captured, they've actually found US-made chips um, from Xilinx, um, integrated silicone solution, analog devices, and Texas instruments. And um, it seems that a lot of these radios were actually newly made, which would actually be a sanctions violation. So there's actually investigations currently going on to actually see, you know, what happened there. There, um, there are also vehicles in uh, Russia's electronic warfare units. Um, that have the capability to relay messages, but also to do radio and GPS jamming. Um, so the vehicles that you see on the left are part of that unit. And this jamming was uh, tracked by zero, uh, various third parties. Um, and GPS is a very important thing for marine and aviation traffic. So, um, you know, they were able to track that and map that, and it correlated very well with uh, Russian troop movements. Uh, the Ukrainian military actually managed to capture a lot of these uh, vehicles, as well as actually destroy uh, some of them using artillery. And the general that looks after electronic warfare was also killed in the battlefield. So looking at the Ukrainian radio systems, um, they have a, a bunch of different radio systems, including uh, systems from Asylum, Motorola, L3, Harris, and Balfin. Um, and these radios were provided uh, by uh, the USA package that was uh, passed earlier uh, this year. 
On the motor runner side, um, they typically give the higher models to uh, commanders and the lower models to soldiers uh, because they don't need to be on as many frequencies as the uh, commanders need to be on. And at least for the motor runner systems, um, as well as the others, but on the motor runner system specifically, um, they are secure because they use uh, DMR for protection. Uh, it's encrypted with RC4, which is vulnerable to the flipping attacks. Um, but because the keys are relatively uh, short, they can easily be broken with modern computers. However, it's not necessarily always technically possible to do this on the battlefield. Um, next, I wanted to look at how President Zelensky is communicating. So uh, he has uh, three different phones, uh, including um, you know, the phone on the top right, which is an old-style phone, which has uh, speed dials to different government departments, which is not encrypted. And then the phone to the below that and to the left is um, a Soviet area phone that operates on a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, it's not encrypted, but it is run on a secure network. So um, you pick, it doesn't have a keypad, so you pick up the one side and then the other side rings. Uh, Russia uses the same set of phones you can see in this photo taken in 2012. And then a more recent photo taken in September, uh, you can see those phones on Vladimir Putin's desk. Um, when President Zelensky communicates to other foreign leaders, he typically uses a commercial VoIP phone, like the Empire B149. And then when he speaks to the uh, President of the United States, um, he typically uses a Cisco Unified phone, and you can see a photo of the White House on there. Um, and this is likely connected uh, to the U.S. Defense Red Switch Network, um, which is relayed through a local U.S. embassy in or near Ukraine. Um, the U.S. has also provided uh, President Zelensky with a satellite phone as well, and this has allowed him to address the nation as well as EU Parliament, which has had a morale boost in the country, especially during um, the beginning of the war. Uh, keeping internet up and running in Ukraine has really been a, a hard challenge, you know, with all of uh, you know the, these weapons being used. Um, and what some internet service providers did, uh, like Cogent, um, they actually put kill switches on on their network, so on, in the network devices. So when um, the Russians uh, started uh, claiming territory, um, they would trigger the kill switch, and then the Russians wouldn't be able to use the equipment afterwards. Uh, during the first weeks of the war, there were several internet outages, and as um, the, this affected the internet quite a lot, and as repairs started to happen, uh, the internet uh, traffic started to uh, return back to normal. Um, in this photo, uh, which was actually one of the most striking photos um, of the war for me, uh, is this photo of fiber technicians, you know, on the front lines in a battlefield actually repairing fiber. Um, this was quite striking to me, and this is another um, photo, you know, kind of showing this. And these telecommunication, uh, you know, capabilities have really exposed some of the war crimes that have been going on. For example, in this case, where uh, Russian armor attacks are on um, core, which actually is a war crime, as well as the atrocities in uh, Bucha, where uh, you know hundreds, potentially thousands of people um, were killed uh, in uh, execution style. And because of social media. Again, with the telecommunications, um, there are several investigations by different organizations looking at the war crimes that are currently going on in Ukraine. And this has also been investigated by the International Criminal uh, Court. Um, yeah. Um, so as Russia started to get more territory, um, they also wanted to start rerouting that traffic through Russia using BGP hijacks. So um, they performed a number of large uh, BGP hijacks, um, which had a, a significant impact on latency. And uh, some of these uh, attacks were actually successful. However, some of them were not due to the use of RPKI. So many internet service providers were using RPKI, which requires that BGP requests be signed. And as Russia started doing these attacks, more uh, ISP started to adopt um, uh, RPKI as a result of that. Um, and despite the work being done to keep uh, these telecoms 
telco systems up, up and running. Um, there were some dead spots. Uh, Ukraine asked uh, SpaceX for um, a bunch of Starlink uh, terminals which were delivered to them. Um, but what was interesting to point out is that one of the executives of ISAT actually publicly criticized uh, Starlink uh, and SpaceX last year um, for their constellation, calling it irresponsible. And then given that their network went down, they kind of had a bit of egg on their face. Um, I do want to point out that uh, Leonard did a really good talk at DEF CON, kind of doing a reverse kind of, the, you know, reverse engineering and security analysis on the Starlink terminal, which is, he found to be really good. You know, these things have really been battle hardened. Um, and in his uh, kind of research, he wanted to get access, which he managed to do uh, through the uh, UART port. Um, he disclosed this to SpaceX's uh, product security incident response team, and they uh, basically um, pushed out new firmware, which blew the e-fuses um, on the on these ports. Um, and then just to mention, he's doing quite a bit of other cool research, um, looking at various voltage and glitching attacks, uh, including building his own SOC to achieve some of these attacks. So moving on to Russian disinformation. So in the Russian doctrine, the uh, Russian military is organized into five different uh, kind of units um, or divisions, uh, including the military, oceanic, aerospace, nuclear forces, and strategic operations for critical targets. And as part of this doctrine, Russia wants to use information warfare um, to plant and spread false narratives to mislead, misdirect, and confuse people. So in the lead up to the Crimea, uh, the annexation of Crimea and following that, um, Russia had several disinformation campaigns that they were using. And then when the invasion stopped, there were over 300 um, different false narratives that Russia was putting. I'm not going to go through all of them and that will take quite, quite some time, but there's really, what I'm trying to show you is like the amount of false narratives is, is a very, very false. Um, one of these false narratives is the uh, history of Russia and the Soviet Union. So the Russian government, especially Vladimir Putin, is really working hard to try and rewrite the history. And Memorial, which is uh, Russia's oldest human rights uh, organization, um, was actually ordered by a Russian judge uh, to be liquidated at the beginning of this war. And Memorial keeps uh, documents and artifacts that show the atrocities that occurred under Stalin. Memorials that were created to, uh, you know, remember those lost to Stalin's actions are also being taken down. And new memorials have been created on several buildings, like the one on the right, uh, which is actually created uh, on a building opposite the Kremlin. So it's not even like subtle what they're trying to do. And then, obviously, uh, the use of social media for these disinformation campaigns, you know, has been, um, you know, used quite uh, widely. Um, I tried to do a very rudimentary analysis. So in uh, July, I actually managed to identify at least 8,000 accounts that were involved in this kind of disinformation campaign. Um, I should mention that the data is not like 100% clean. Um, these are just observations that I made. And then the second time I did this analysis, I was able to identify 12,000 accounts. But unfortunately, I lost my first data set because I didn't change the output file name when I uh, ran my scripts like a mom. <laughs> Um, but nevertheless, uh, what I also observed was that bots um, would engage with uh, content posted by uh, Russian government officials as well as other influencers. Um, and unfortunately, uh, since Elon has taken over, the Twitter API is not uh, behaving as it has in the past because I wanted to take some inspiration from Rudolf's talk that he did at uh, Hexcon um, to kind of you know see if I could see anything else. Um, unfortunately not. So one of the narratives as well is this uh, thing of Russian aggression. So last year Russia was putting, uh, pushing this narrative that they're not aggressive and then this year they want to go liberate uh, Ukraine, which uh, obviously requires aggression. But the um, Ukrainian military also found they uh, confiscated 10,000 SIM cards that were part of five uh, Russian platforms to spread disinformation. 
Um, and the use of Telegram is also quite pervasive. So um, there are literally hundreds of Telegram channels where uh, this, this information is being posted for Russian citizens. Um, and because uh, of the fact that it's in Telegram, it can't be sent to Brown Center Bills on Twitter, um, like Twitter could take action against that. And these, these channels have enormous followings. Like um, I've seen some with 10, 100,000, even uh, millions of followers. And the average post gets around 500,000 views as a result of that. Um, one of the other uh, campaigns that happened was is the EU announced um, a aid package for, uh, to provide additional systems to Ukraine. And within one day of this an announcement, there was already um, a Russian disinformation campaign targeting um, the validity of this assistance. And it was then posted over a hundred Telegram channels and as well as social media accounts of various Russian uh, diplomats uh, and diplomatic channels as well. Um, when volunteer fighters went to uh, Ukraine uh, to fight for Ukraine, um, there was a disinformation target uh, the campaign targeting them, as well as um, a disinformation campaign that uh, launched when um, the embassy in New York City was actually vandalized. Um, and one of the counter narratives there was, you know, the building wasn't vandalized, it's just blushing that there's an embassy in Tarabit. And when similar attacks happened in Germany and uh, Ireland, uh, Russia very quickly pulls the victim card um, to kind of combine that with the disinformation campaigns that they are doing. The Ukrainian military also runs Army FM. Um, this is a way to broadcast uh, the great, like what's happening and the correct information, especially in some of the captured areas. Russia has been trying to jam these radio st uh, stations, um, but Ukraine uh, military that's on the front lines is actually rebroadcasting some of these um, signals to try to get you know, that across into the captured areas. Um, Russia has had heavy losses on the battlefields, um, and before the war, the army was, you know, significantly larger than Ukraine's. I mean, even if you take into consideration the weapons that were provided by NATO countries, um, they really should have won the war. But I think this was a massive miscalculation on behalf of Putin, um, and I think the bad leadership, uh, you know, as we'll show in a moment, like really shows the, you know, the reason why they haven't seen the success that they probably should have seen. Um, Russia's useful idiot, Alexander Lukashenko, uh, who's the president of Belarus, actually went on live TV and actually literally like put the plan of what they were trying to do, like how stupid can you be? And then this famous photo that, you know, was also shared on social media quite a lot, where you just see a Russian uh, armor and uh, other vehicles, you know, in this massive uh, line. Um, this really shows the poor logistics of, on, of the um, Russian military, um, and this was the result of miscommunication as well as lack of leadership. And I should mention that uh, this was actually due to a cyber attack uh, that was on the Belarusian rail system. Um, it wasn't the only reason, but it, like, it did play into this. And what we also saw is, um, you know, just the failure of Russia to be able to supply its troops. So NATO uses a pool-based system, so units on the battlefield can request items and then it's sent to them. Uh, Russia uses a push-based system, so um, they average what people need, uh, you know, what items they need and they send that to them. And what this leads to is both oversupply and undersupply of items, um, which is not great. And recently, uh, Russia hasn't been able to provide socks to um, its soldiers. Um, and they have to use these pieces of cloth for patentes. Um, and, you know, what does it say about your military when you can't even provide socks to your, um, you know, your, your soldiers? And there's this like, kind of thing saying, you know, amateurs think about tactics, uh, professionals think about logistics. We've also seen uh, bad behavior and poor discipline on the uh, radius, on the, uh, you know, from the Russian military. You see a tank, you know, driving into street poles. Um, each time it does this, obviously it affects the accuracy of the, the turret. Um, as well as, you know, Ukrainian farmers uh, towing away Russian armor uh, that has been captured. 
and this hasn't gone down very well in, in Russia. So there's a Russian saying um, which translates it into English, which says, uh, so is good, boys are bad, boys are the tallest vessels, and you know, it doesn't really translate well into English. But effectively what that's saying is you don't criticize so, which is uh, President Putin, uh, you criticize the people who are in charge of implementing his decision, which are the Russian uh, med um, generals. So what has happened on Telegram with a lot of these uh, you know, influencers, they've had been pushing this uh, you know, narrative that the Russian generals are doing a really bad job. And a linguistic analysis on this has actually shown that um, these people are not actually writing uh, this. This is, this is actually coming from the Kremlin. So the Kremlin is passing this message along and then the influencers are, are passing that along. What also... Um, happened was uh, the memes are starting to be used in, in the war um, and this is uh, you know, been a way to kind of poke fun at Russia and Putin and um, I'm showing English memes here but uh, there are memes in uh, Russian as well typically the memes are created in both English and Russian um, for, for at least some of them um, and this is very effective when uh, to highlight the achievements on the battlefield so in this case you see uh, Russia um, so when the Ukraine attacked uh, Crimea, you know, there's a me making fun of it was probably, uh, you know, an accident. Um, when they attacked an airbase, you know, the same thing. When Russian soldiers started digging trenches at Chernobyl, which is uh, radiologically active, you know, making fun of that situation as well. When the UK Prime Minister visited as well, it's like, you know, I dare you to send the missile to Ukraine, uh, Kiev when I'm there. Um, there was also a Russian uh, surface to air missile that misfunctioned and uh, landed at uh, from the wrong side. And then I had another me kind of making fun of that. And when uh, Ukraine um, got, you know, liberated Kherson, you know, it's like, well, this is the worst day of the war. It's like, well, no, it's the worst day of the year so far. Um, as Russia started to retreat, they left a lot of ammunition uh, around. Um, and Ukraine was able to use that ammunition to actually target Russian uh, soldiers and, you know, again, making fun of the fact that uh, Russia is probably Ukraine's uh, largest bomb supplier. Um, and this is one of my uh, favorites. Um, this is a non-traditional soldier that uh, shot down a helicopter um, and then a whole bunch of memes were posted as a result of this. But the reason why it's my favorite is because so many Russians like absolutely lost their mind with this meme. Um, so yeah, and then there was another video from uh, a Russian state journalist who was reporting, you know, from the, the front lines and then got knocked over from the blast when the uh, artillery went off. Um, several uh, Russian generals were actually killed, both one star and two star generals. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, the uh, the the general that's in charge of uh, electronic warfare was also killed uh, as well. And then again, means making fun of uh, that fact. Um, a lot of old uh, weapons from World War I and World War II have been observed on the battlefield, including the MP40, as well as various rifles. Um, the maximum machine gun from World War I was found on the battlefield um, by Ukrainian soldiers. So these are Russian weapons found by Ukrainian soldiers. And then in this video, you can kind of see the, the kind of contrast between um, the 21st century weapons that Ukraine is using versus the World War I weapons that some Russian soldiers are using. And despite all of the weapon systems provided uh, to Ukraine from NATO, um, they, they still needed funding to get other equipment that they needed. So they started a project called San Javelin, um, which was uh, aimed to raise funds to get these. Um, and obviously praising the Chapman system, which has been very effective against Russian armor. So they put this on merch, uh, they painted it on buildings, they sold, uh, sold artwork for up to $70,000. Um, they put that on t-shirts, which they gave to President Zelensky, as well as the, um, the Defense Minister of Estonia. And a Russian uh, SU-34 jets were actually shot down. Um, so what they did is they uh, made key holders size mementos from the, air, the skin of the aircraft and then started selling that. Um, and I love the tagline, you know, made in Russia, recycled in Ukraine. Um, <laughs> and 
And what they also did is they had a website where you could actually pay to have uh, messages put on uh, munitions. So for two hundred dollars, you can have a, a, a message written on the shell. For seven hundred dollars, you can have text put on an exact Excalibur weapon. Um, and these are just some examples of that. Uh, for thirty thousand dollars, you can uh, put stickers on an SU twenty four uh, jet. Um, and uh, there was even a marriage proposal, so somebody paid to have text put on, which I thought is a little bit threatening, you know, what if anybody said no, that's a bit weird. And then this is a bug system, so um, for those of you that don't know, a bug TILO uh, system was used to shoot down um, an airplane in uh, a Malaysian airline uh, airplane, which is kind of making, uh, you know, lots of that situation. They raised over a million dollars. So the screenshot is all public, um, and they've received, you know, uh, you know, a lot of funding as a result of this. And it has also boosted the morale of the soldiers because obviously they see that you know other people are supporting them. And with that funding, they were able to purchase their cars, drones, armored vests, sleeping bags, uh, beds, power banks, radios, and warnings, and as well as drones, which they spent most of the money on. Um, so what they've been doing is instead of using the conventional uh, drones, they've been using consumer drones like the DJI Mavic and then putting a special harness under the drone to actually release grenades from the air. Um, the way that they do this is they put a sensor uh, from the landing light. So um, uh, because the landing light can be controlled remotely via the smartphone app and the controller, um, they can put the the uh, you know this harness underneath it and then uh, uh, use the light to remotely trigger it to fall down. So that's an example of what that looks like. Um, this was first used in Iraq in 2017 um, where they actually put bird feathers at the at the back of it to add a bit of stability um, and this has uh, proven to be very useful at disabling uh, Russian tanks. So in this situation you have you know a few hundred dollars uh, drone taking out a multi-million dollar attack. Um, I'm not showing the more graphic uh, videos, but um, there are videos of these uh, drones flying over foxholes, and then they drop it, and then obviously a whole bunch of uh, Russian soldiers are killed in the process. So the Ukrainian military has uh, asked for donations of these drones and have received them, and then these are just some uh, pictures of the various uh, deliveries. Um, if anybody knows why they prefer the orange drones as opposed to the grey zone uh, drones, I would love to hear your opinion. I spent so much time trying to get the answer, but have been unable to do so. Um, and in this photo, you can see at the bottom the, uh, the honors that they use uh, to release these drones. Um, and these drones, uh, you know, kind of complement the higher end drones that they have, uh, which are used for reconnaissance. And this also complements uh, their existing drones that they have, as well as the drones provided to them from the US. Um, and Russia has also started to take notes and is using the same drones. In this uh, footage, you actually see a Russian drone trying to knock out a Ukrainian drone, and you know, obviously, it's not very successful. Uh, Russia has also purchased uh, suicide drones from Iran, um, so they can put a few. Uh, a few kilograms of explosives on these drones and then they fly them into the targets that they want to um, you know target and um, they also found US chips on these drones which would actually be a sanctions violation and in response EU sanctions have actually additional EU sanctions have been added um, as as a result of that um, the Ukrainian military has had a lot of success at taking down uh, Russian uh, um, reconnaissance drones uh, using various channels to mess with the frequencies um, and they're also using their own loitering munitions. So in this example you see a Russian uh, loitering munition um, attacking a Ukrainian tank and then obviously that uh, you know takes that out. And then kind of the last thing I wanted to talk about is NAFO, which is kind of a play on NATO. So instead of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, we have the North Atlantic Fellows Organization. And this is a group specifically uh, uh, you know, designed to kind of counter some of the disinformation that Russia is actually pushing out. So what they do is they use anthropomorphic uh, Shiba Inu dogs. Uh, to make memes and then they make fun of what's actually going on. So for so this example, you know, they're fighting NATO, it's like actually, no, you're losing to our separate stories. 
uh, you know, tearing the stuffing out of ethnics. Uh, for those of you that don't know, ethnics are people who believe Russian propaganda. Uh, this is just a few additional um, examples. And even the uh, defense minister of Ukraine was actually seen wearing the T-shirts with the Shiva Inu. And I just want to point out that Shiva Inu is actually wearing the T-shirt of a Saint Judgment. So that circle is nice to see uh, being closed. Um, a lot of artwork has also been created to counter, uh, you know, some of these uh, false narratives. For those of you that are good with history, um, you might recognize some of the uh, sayings on these artworks. Um, and, you know, and memes, I guess. And what also happened was, is they started putting Shiva Inu stickers on uh, Russian, uh, on uh, Ukrainian, um, you, you know, weapon systems. Uh, you know, like the super bunker on the, the, the turret, um, as well as the Napa baseball bats on the turret as well. Um, and the U.S. Uh, government also provided uh, Ukraine with 16 high mobility artillery rocket systems or HIMARS. Um, which have been very successful at taking our Russian targets, for example, ammunition depots um, and other critical uh, targets. And I can assure you that these uh, assets are like probably the most well-protected uh, assets in Ukraine because of how successful they are. Um, Ukraine actually creates a deep, uh, various decoys um, to actually draw out some of Russia's more expensive uh, cruise missiles because of the important targets. And then obviously they deplete uh, Russia's um, cruise missiles in the process. Um, and as a result of the effectivity of the animals, um, you know, a lot of memes uh, come about. Um, and if you look on social media, what you'll see is whenever you see a false Russian narrative being pushed, like somebody from NAFA will actually respond typically with this meme, but there's a lot of others. Um, when a whole bunch of uh, vehicles were actually donated to Ukraine, um, they actually put the NAFA sticker on the vehicle. Um, when I first saw this video, I couldn't believe it, but it's like, I just, like, I, you know, I just, you know, find it, find it funny. Um, and obviously the Russian trolls really don't like this. Um, they, you know, have been complaining with Twitter. And um, what this led to was a U.S. intelligence account actually tweeting, uh, you know, that, you know, of this activity. And if you had told me at the beginning of the war that, um, you know, a U.S. intelligence account would be tweeting that, uh, you know, sheep in your dogs are like making Russian trolls mad, I probably would have laughed in your face. There have been allegations by certain charlatans in the community, like King.com, that this is a CIA information operation, which is not true. Uh, NAFA was actually created by a Ukrainian with the goal of, uh, you know, countering this, this information campaign. I'm sure Western intelligence is probably contributing to NAFA and is probably creating these memes themselves. Um, but I don't believe that it's a, a, you know, Western intelligence operation from the beginning. And then to kind of close off a little bit, um, I do think what is very clear is that Russia has lost this information war uh, to a bunch of cartoon dogs. And then in closing, you know, where do we go from here? Yeah, so Russia invaded Ukraine with uh, up to 180,000 troops. They've lost at least 85,000 troops, including a lot of fighters and equipment. Uh, currently, Russia controls about 20% of Ukraine, which is about a 900 by 85 kilometer area. And um, a victory for Ukraine or Russia is probably not going to be possible. Um, uh, and the Ukrainian a victory, which is defined as them kicking out Russia from the country, uh, is very unlikely. And what this will probably require is a, a political solution, because I don't think uh, weapons are going to end the war. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, this is you know kind of what many analysts are kind of, kind of saying. Um, and then to close off, I would like to say a massive thank you to all the researchers, journalists, analysts, activists, and institutions that put out their research. Um, this presentation would not be possible with the, without their research. Um, and, you know, I like the saying that we like to build our work on the shoulders of giants, and that's when we can really do good things. And then just a special thanks to Mika, Dimitri, Ryan, and Stephen, and Joseph uh, for, you know, helping to form some of my views and answering my questions. And with that, that is the end of my presentation and happy to take any questions. Cool. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, well, this is probably a simple question, but you mentioned with the phones that they have an unencrypted, secure telecoms network. What does that mean? Because in my head, secure is encrypted. So, so the the way that I understand it is that the phones themselves, uh, the signals are not encrypted, but the network that it runs on is encrypted. So there might be, I don't know the full technical details, but there's probably like layer two uh, line encryptors on the network and uh, it's probably protected. I mean, you see this a lot with ICS network chart where they aren't, they aren't encrypted, but they are well protected. So. But sorry, where I understand that is that it's actually just a direct line. It's not, it doesn't have to be encrypted with a direct line. It's like you're not connected with your laptop, the network, but my laptop is directly connected, connected to yours with a landing. That's essentially the difference on that side, but instead of such a group that if you pick up this side, it brings on the other side. Yeah, but because, you know, it's potentially long distances, um, I do think there is like layer two. Uh, you know, encrypt, but I don't know the technical means also, yeah. Uh, the, the grenade releases on the drones. Do you have any information as to where that design came from? No idea. Yeah. There's a saying that uh, in any war, the first casualty is the truth. So the question that I have to you is, do you believe that Ukraine is totally innocent in this whole exercise? So there have been allegations of war crimes made up against the you know Ukraine military. Um, and, you know, like, it's possible and very likely that they have, you know, committed war crimes. Um, the evidence, and, you know, of that is, you know, not really clear. Um, I think it's absolutely possible. I wouldn't say, you know, 100% yes or no on that. Cool. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it's like that.